I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Midweek Show. We're going to do things a little bit differently this week. Since we have two recordings, two, uh, two articles, they're fairly lengthy, so we're not going to dive into a whole bunch of discussion. And we're not going to do the discussion after each one. What we'll do is we'll, we'll chat a little bit about the articles, then we'll let you listen to them. They're both Argosy Magazine articles. One is from 1968, and it's a... Uh, article by Ivan Sanderson and it's about the Patterson filming and what's interesting about that is he relates quite a bit of information in there that Roger Patterson told him and he quotes him on things so and the second article will Tom and I'll talk a little bit about that when it's Bigfoot man beast or myth that's from December 1977 and it's kind of a mixed bag the first part of the article is an actual encounter of an individual and it doesn't give the date but it's in northern california so apparently the mount shasta area so the second part is interesting too and i, I know about this article we may do a, a segment just on this article but it's in april 1840 the reverend Elkana walker missionary to the spokane indians and it's about what he wrote and um, and what the natives told him about the creatures and it's interesting 1840 but what's really interesting is towards the end of that article tom there's a couple of pieces in there that we hear about today it says if the people are awake they always know when they are coming very near meaning the creatures he says by their strong smell which is most intolerable now these two pieces are very interesting it is not uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles and then the stones will begin to hit their houses. And that was written in 1840. 1840. That's why we're doing this Bigfoot in history, folks, is because we're seeing the trend. Their behavior hasn't changed. It's, it, it validates what we're seeing today. It's consistent. Yes, absolutely. I do want to jump in real quick. I just want to say... Folks, if you like the show, please like and subscribe. It help, helps the algorithm. And if you want to support the channel, you can do that with Patreon. And that is in the link. The description, I should say, is in the link. Right. And there's and then after this piece, it goes into, there's some discussion about, again, about the Patterson film. So it's kind of the theme. Last week, we had John Green's interview with Bob Gimlin. And then the Ivan Sanderson article in the beginning of this piece. And now this article, and then the couple of sections we just talked about, and then they he goes into a little bit of um, Patterson filming and what the Russians had to say about it, and also people at Disney Studios. So, uh, and then it goes on after that. There's some stuff from John Napier, who was a, a British anthropologist, and another anthropologist by the name of Dr. Paul Simmons. So there's some discussion there. I guess with that. Tom, do you want to add anything else before we go ahead and launch these two pieces of audio? I just want to comment real quick on what the Russians said about the uh, Patterson-Gimlin film. They said that they felt that it was authentic. They'd studied it, and it was... The Patterson-Gimlin film is second viewed and analyzed only to the Zabruder film in history. Those are the two most top uh, viewed films that have been analyzed. So um, just a quick note on that. They definitely believe that it, it's the real thing. All right, folks. So having said these uh, small pieces here for your uh, information, we're going to go ahead and run both the uh, 
audio is there, Jim Sowers reading, so uh, the first one's going to be Sanderson's article, the second one is going to be this article titled Bigfoot, Man, Beast, or Myth. So without any further ado, folks, stand by. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. For more than a century, people have been saying that a huge, hairy, primitive human roams the unmapped mountains of the Northwest. Here is the first tangible evidence that Bigfoot or Sasquatch really exists. The first photos of Bigfoot, California's legendary abominable snowman, by Ivan T. Sanderson. Sanderson was heavily credentialed. Listen for his bio at the end of the story. At 3.30 p.m. on the 20th of October last year, two young men, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, were packing it on horseback into one of the last remaining great wilderness areas, northeast of Eureka, California. Their saddlebags contained on one side rifles and grub, and on the other, ready-loaded movie and steel cameras and other equipment. They were following a creek which had been washed out two years ago in the terrible floods that devastated most of northern California. This was some 20 miles beyond the end of an access road for logging, and about 35 miles in from the nearest and only blacktop road in this vast and yet not fully mapped area of National Forest. I have been up this bluff creek, and as a botanist I can tell you that it is rugged, Four layers of tiers of trees that the tallest is up to 200 feet, and dense undergrowth. Also, the terrain goes up and down a gigantic sawtooth. Roger and Bob rounded a sharp bend in the sandy arroyo of the creek. Then it happened. The horses reared suddenly in alarm and threw both riders. Luckily, Roger fell off to the right, and, being an experienced horseman, disengaged himself and grabbed his camera. Why? Because he had spotted what had turned their horses into mad broncos. At about 100 feet ahead, and on the other side of the creek bed, there was a huge, hairy creature that walked like a man. The way Roger described it to me would not, I am afraid, make much sense to you, but then Roger had been hunting this sort of creature for many years. What he actually said was, Gosh darn it, Ivan, right there was a Bigfoot. And for pity's sake, she was a female. Just wait till you see the film. Roger is a Northwesterner, and he does not waste words. But what he does say, I listen to. This is what he told me. On the other side of the creek, back up against the trees, there was a sort of man-creature that we estimated later, by measuring some logs that appear in the film, to have been about seven feet tall, both Bob and I estimate, and this pretty well matched what others told us from the examination of the depth to which her track sank into the hard sand, that she would weigh about 350 pounds. She was covered with short, shiny black hair, even her big, droopy breasts. She seemed to have a sort of peak on the back of her head, but whether this was longer hair or not, I don't know. Anyhow, hair came right down her forehead to meet her eyebrows, if she had any, and it came right up to her, just under her cheekbones. Oh, and get this, she had no neck. What I mean is, the bottom of her head just seemed to broaden out onto and into her wide, muscular shoulders. I don't think you'll see it in the film, but she walked like a big man in no hurry, and the soles of her feet were definitely light in color. This last bit got me as I have seen really black-skinned Melanesians with pale pink palms and soles. I don't want to sound facetious, but this whole thing gets hairier and hairier, as you will see in a moment. Roger did something then that I have never known any professional photographers to do. Even if his camera was loaded with the right film, he had the cap lens off, the thing was set to the right f-stop, and so on, he started running, hand-holding his Kodak 16mm loaded with Kodachrome film, trying to focus on this creature. What he got was just about what any amateur would get in such circumstances, but then he got a real break. As Roger put it, she was just swinging along as the first part of my film shows, but all of a sudden she just stopped dead and looked around at me. She wasn't scared a bit. 
Fact is, I don't think she was scared of me, and the only thing I can think of is that the clicking of my camera was new to her. Okay, I said. Tell me this, Roger. The hunting season was on, wasn't it? You're darn shooting right it was, Bob Gimlin chimed in. And out that way, anything moving with fur on it is liable to get shot. But actually, there just aren't any hunters way up there. Twenty miles beyond the only road known as the Bluff Creek Access, could it be that Mrs. Bigfoot knew all about guns but was puzzled by the whirring of a small movie camera? And another thing, everybody who says they have been close to one of these creatures or has found one of their beds has stressed the ghastly, nauseating stink they exude and leave behind. Was this what really scared the horses? Or did the horses scare the adorable woodsman, which is my name for the lady? While we referred to this in the title as the abominable snowman for purposes of quick identification, the Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, zoologically, has nothing to do with the Himalayan abominable snowman known for centuries in Asia, and first brought to the attention of the Western world in 1921. Our lady is a form of primitive, full-furred human. The yeti, or abominable snowman of the Himalayas, is some sort of giant rock-climbing ape, in my opinion, and that of Professor Carlton S. Kuhn. The yeti footprints found have an opposed big toe, almost like a hand. The Bigfoot has an unopposed toe, such as is seen only on human-type creatures. While Roger took the film, Bob got the horses calmed down and then rode over the creek. Roger was running again after the Bigfoot, still hand-holding his movie camera, despite the logs and trash on the route that she took, and it was not even a game trail. He got sortie parting shots, which turned out to be of particular interest to the scientist. But we will come to that later. At that point, I asked Bob, because he was then what is called the backup man, which means that he was now close enough to see Roger clearly. Just what was Roger doing? Well, he was running like hell, jumping them logs and going up into the real thick bush. Did you see her too? Yeah, Ivan, but way ahead and really taken off of the hills. This brought me up sharp, because I had by that time viewed their film, and half a dozen of the takeouts blown up in full color as transparencies which I had examined under strong magnifying lenses on an illuminated shadow box several times, and projected by three different projectors. In every case, the creature was at standard speed for photogs, 24 frames per second. As Roger said, at first the thing just ambling along, swinging her rather long arms, not running scared, and even stopping for a brief look-see over her shoulder, as it were, then ambling on again into the deep woods, yet here was the backup man saying that she had taken off for the hills. Roger, however, backed up his backup man unprompted. Yeah, when she got around the corner and into the real heavy stuff, the timber and underbrush, she did take off, running, I mean, because when we lost her tracks on the pine needles after tracking her for about three and a half miles, we took plaster casts of her tracks. Now, down by the creek, in the sand, where we first spotted her, her stride was from 40 to 42 inches from the back of the heel to the left side to the back of the right heel ahead, but... When she got really going, she left tracks that measured 65 inches from back heel to the back heel. Man, she was running just like you and I do. Why she? I asked Roger. Well, Ivan, let's run that film through again, and you tell me, as a trained zoologist, if that thing has pendulous breasts or not. Well, we ran the film again, slowly, and we had a stop and hold device on the projector by which we can hold any frame without fear of burning it. This we did, and so help me, there are definitely large pendant breasts fully covered with short black hair. No ape or monkey is known to have any such development of the female mammary glands. Human beings, on the other hand, do, frequently. Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin actually had nothing much more to add. They presented us, both newsmen and scientists, with this film for appraisal. We viewed it and our findings follow. But, for my money, these young men, after six years of sensible effort, have turned up with the first bit of possibly concrete evidence for something that, however fantastic it may sound, 
has been going on for years, both in this country and Canada, and a lot of other places in the world, like Russia, for instance. So let me get down to a proper analysis from both a scientific and a journalistic point of view. Before I do this, however, I want to say that in this day of technology, anything can be a hoax. But elaborate hoaxes cost a lot of money, and if they are to fool scientists and the like, they also require plenty of knowledge. Anyway, here's what we did to verify and check it out. I have known Roger Patterson by correspondence for about six years, he tells me, and this flatters the hell out of me that he got interested in this business from reading a book that I published in 1961, entitled Snowmen, Legend Come to Life, which was a compendium of all that I had been able to find in published form on this subject up to that date. I, myself, have been researching it since 1930. During this work, I found that the British had first become cognizant of the matter in Asia in 1921, and quite by mistake. However, as I went back in history, I discovered that just such hairy, primitive, non-tribalized, human-like creatures have been reported by scholars of various cultures and in literature for centuries from almost all over the world. Thus, what Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin achieved is not just an isolated incident. It fits a pattern, and precisely. But what happened next? Well, these young men had the sense to get their film carefully processed, under guard, a copy made, and the original locked up in a vault so that it could not be scratched, stolen, or destroyed. Then they went to the one group of people who really know about faking things, especially like King Kong, ape men, and other phony monsters, namely Universal Pictures in Hollywood. There they met Dale Sheets, head of the documentary film department, and top technicians in what is called the special effects department, who are the men who have actually made such things for the movies. They asked the technicians, in effect, Look at this strip of film, fellows, and then tell us if you could produce that for us. No, the experts answered. Maybe if you allotted a couple of million bucks, we could try, but we'd have to invent a whole new set of artificial muscles, get a gorilla skin, and train an actor to walk like that. It might be done, but offhand would say it would be nearly impossible. So then, Bob and Roger applied to various groups of American scientists out west. None were seriously interested. There were, however, two Canadians who had also been looking into this matter in their country, where the creatures have been named Sasquatches. These Canadians, Mr. John Green, a newspaper publisher of Harrison Lakes, British Columbia, and René de Hinden, originally a Swiss mountaineer, but for the past two decades, a government forestry officer for the Canadian government flew down to Yakima, Washington, and invited Roger, Bob, and Roger's brother-in-law, Al de Atley, to come up to British Columbia and give a group of scientists there a showing. They did, in Vancouver. At this meeting, there were, in addition to Dr. Ian McTaggart Cowan, Dean of Graduate Studies at the University of British Columbia, who is the province's leading zoologist, a dozen or so scientists, including Don Abbott, an anthropologist with the Provincial Museum in Victoria. Most of the scientists admitted in print that, though they had come to the meeting skeptics, they had left somewhat shaken. Here's how they stated their reactions to the Vancouver province next day. Dr. McTaggart Cowan summed up the more cautious opinions when he said, The more a thing deviates from the known, the better the proof of its existence must be. Don Abbott spoke for the dozen or so scientists who appeared remarkably close to being convinced. It is about as hard to believe the film is faked as it is to admit that such a creature really lives. If there's a chance to follow up scientifically, my curiosity is built to the point where I'd want to go along with it. Like most scientists, however, I am not ready to put my reputation on the line until something concrete shows up, something like bones or a skull. Frank Beebe, well-known Vancouver naturalist and Provincial Museum illustrator, commented, I'm not convinced, but I think the film is genuine. And if I were out in the mountains and I saw a thing like this one, I wouldn't shoot it. 
I'd be too afraid of how human it would look under the fur. From a scientific standpoint, one of the hardest facts to go against is that there is no evidence anywhere in the Western Hemisphere of primate, ape, monkey, evolution, and the creature in the film is definitely a primate. Beebe's objection, however, was typical of those given by other experts who ventured out of their own specialties to comment. Since I know something about primates and about geography, I brought this matter to the attention of Dr. Joseph T. Rate, who happens to be the chief geographer of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. His statement appears in detail elsewhere in this magazine, but I may sum it up here by saying that the distinguished Dr. Rate, whose doctorate, by the way, is in human ecology, responded in effect bunk to this last objection, one leading American weekly appeared to have been sufficiently impressed by the film to fly Roger, Bob, and Al with their film and outtakes from the same blown-up to New York to hear their story straight. Armed with the film and these statements, the three landed in New York and gave me a buzz. I was with them in two hours, and then the jazz began. Every time we called upon anybody, we were asked for further confirmation. It was not easy, but we got it, step by step. But after a week of spending other people's money, the boys, as I call them, though they are all married and fathers, got a really rude, flat, and, in my opinion, senseless turndown. So that's why the story I'm writing is in these pages. The boys have not asked anybody for a single cent for what they've got. All they wanted was to be reimbursed for their out-of-pocket expenses. This has been done. For the rest, they need sufficient funds to mount a properly equipped but trained small group to go into this or another wilderness area for a full year to stage a real hunt for a Bigfoot, captured alive or on film, or else at least for a skull or other physical evidence. The most common question asked me about these Bigfoot of California and the similar Sasquatches of Canada is, why has nobody ever seen one? The answer to this is, they have, and by the hundreds, and for a hundred years, let alone the earlier sightings by local Indians. One is even alleged to have been captured on the Trans-Canada Railroad's tracks in 1884, to have been examined by medical men and held in captivity for some time. It was even mentioned in official dispatches to the Crown by the then colonial governor of British Columbia. Further, I personally took an ex extended trip in 1959 to the west, covering just about every area from Alaska to California and even the Canadian Northwest Territories, interviewing several dozen people who said they had encountered these creatures. All of my findings up to 1961 went into my book, mentioned earlier. Since then, however, further reports have continued to stream in at a minimum of once a month. Meantime, eight groups that I know of went into the field apart from Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, and I know the last of several scores of interviews on tape with other witnesses. What is more, none other than Dr. Vladimir Markchok, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Calgary, Alberta, made two trips to the same area and assessed the current reports two years ago. The next most common question from non-zoologists, that is, is usually... Why, if there are so many of these big creatures running around, haven't we ever found a single bone of one? My answer is simply to go and ask any game warden, real woodsman, or professional animal collector if he has ever found the dead body or even a bone of any wild animal, except along roads, of course, or if killed by man. I never have, in forty years, in five continents, no, nature takes care of her own and damned fast, too. But there is another point here. These creatures are apparently not even tribalized. In fact, they seem to be lone hunters or gatherers, forming only small family parties that break up as soon as the youngsters can get along on their own. Unlike the next stage up the ladder to people, they do not seem to bury their dead. If they did, we might have stumbled across their ritual burial grounds even in caves, though such are rarities, where they are reported to live. Then there is another very prevalent notion. 
Almost everybody except zoologists, and even many of them, seems to believe that no big, new animals could still remain undiscovered. This is a complete fallacy. First, despite all the howls about our population explosion, more than half of the land surface of the earth has not yet been mapped or, for the most part, even penetrated. Further, the world's second bulkiest land animal, Cotton's wide-lipped rhinoceros, was not found until 1910, and the forest giraffe, or okapi, until 1911, and the giant sable antelope until 1929. Then there's the copri, the second largest ox, found in Indochina in 1956, and, of course, the coelacanth fish in 1938, thought to have been extinct for some 70 million years. I might add that two herds, numbering 400 and 300 head respectively, of forest bison, believed to have existed in not too pure a form in only one national park in Canada, turned up in 1960 only 80 miles from the new road going to Great Bear Lake. The Komodo dragon, which is the largest known reptile, wasn't discovered until 1912. The mountain gorilla, an ape species peculiar to Africa, was a native legend for centuries, just like Bigfoot in the Abominable Snowman, but he wasn't established as a real creature by scientists until 1901. The other most asked question comes from the zoologists and professional anthropologists. It is really twofold. How could such a creature be in the North American continent? Because not one single bone or tooth of any true monkey, as opposed to the South American monkeys, which are quite different, and much less an ape, has ever been found here. This is true, but then the same people turn right around and state that our Bigfoot, the Oma, and Sasquatches are hominids, meaning on the human branch of our old family tree. This I find to be completely ridiculous and totally unscientific. Let me explain. First, let us leave monkeys of all kinds out of it, and concentrate on what scientists call the pongids, or apes, the hominids, or man-types. True, no ape has turned up on this continent, and I'm not surprised because they are tropical animals, and although there have been mild temperature times in the Bering Sea and the Aleutians, they have no reason to go meandering all the way up there and over here. The hominids, on the other hand, were represented by several types that lived in cold climates, even up to the ice front, in the case of the Neanderthalers. What is more, hominids in the form of what we call humans, i.e. homo sapiens, such as our American Indians and later the Eskimos, seem to have been able to get here over the land bridge, or the ice bridge at least, according to all the professional scientists. So, may I ask, why is it so all-fired impossible for earlier human types to have done the same? Also, would some anthropologists please explain how our brown bears, elk, moose, and so on got over here from Northeast Asia, where they originated? You can't have it both ways. Either these things are apes, or they're man-like creatures. Everybody says they look like men, even if dressed in monkey suits. Men have gotten here, but the apes have not. Isn't this exactly what the true scientists have been saying all along? Bob and Roger feel that these creatures are definitely human, or at least what scientists call hominid. They may be the last of their race, or subspecies, or other species of us people, and Bob and Roger want them conserved, or at least given a chance. Above all, they don't want mobs armed with high-powered automatic rifles barging in by the thousands and driving the already overworked and understaffed sheriffs, local and state police, out of their minds. Another point. The Minister of Recreation for the Canadian Cabinet, Mr. Kenneth Kirian, has expressed sincere interest in these efforts. So also has our Secretary of the Interior, the Honorable Stuart Udall. The conservation angle to all this is serious enough, but there are other angles that we will not get into at this time. Now comes the end of the story. The leading news media, but not the working press, I should stress, treated this whole thing as an uproarious joke. But one of our leading picture magazines showed genuine interest and arranged for the films and outtakes to be shown to representatives of the departments of zoology and anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Once again, as in Canada, 
the press wire services were on hand, but were informed, in closed session, I am told, by these experts that the whole thing was nothing but a colossal hoax. The exact expression used by their spokesperson being, as reported to me, not kosher. And the reason is alleged to have been simply that such a creature as depicted was impossible. The use of this term, in this case, seemed to imply that while considered a hoax, it was short of a fraud, but if the creature depicted is impossible, then, for my money, it can only be a man-made thing and thus an outright fraudulent design. I have failed to receive any suggestions for a third alternative. This is manifestly a most unsatisfactory situation. Furthermore, their verdict pronounced upon the pictures was handed down so fast that no time could have been given for a proper, thorough, and truly scientific examination of the pictures to have been made. Finally, the existence of such a creature is not impossible. So we, Argosy that is, decided to do something practical. We did. It took time, patience, and real cooperation from several other leading scientists. This is what we did. First, our publisher, Mr. Harry Steger, picked up the tab for the film and pictures so that Bob and Roger and Al could get home for a couple of days for Thanksgiving. Next, I and my friend and partner, Desmond Slattery, drove down to Washington, D.C., where we set up a showing of the film and outtakes and blow-ups of all kinds. Then Argosy editor Milt Macklin flew down with the film and brought his son Jason along, since he is a budding photographer and an electronics wizard as well, in that he ran two tape recordings at different speeds for five solid hours. We then assembled the following persons. One, Mr. N. O. Wood, Jr., Director of Management Operations for the U.S. Department of Interior, representing the Honorable Secretary of that department, Stuart Udall, on his written request to us. Two, Dr. A. Joseph Rate, Chief Geographer, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, currently of the U.S. Department of Commerce, also a human ecologist. Three, Dr. John R. Napier, Doctor of Science, Director of Primate Biology Program, the Smithsonian Institution, world-known expert on human ape and monkey musculature movement and the anatomy of their hands and feet. Four, Dr. Vladimir Marktok, Associate Professor of Archaeology in the University of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Five, Dr. Alan Bryan, Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. Also present were several of us on the other side of the fence. Let me call them the journalists or newsboys or whatever you want. In addition to Des Slattery and Milt Macklin and myself, there was present Tom Allen, currently writer and editor on the editorial staff of the National Geographic Society. Tom has been a working newsman all his life. For seven years, a feature writer and editor of the Sunday New York Daily News and then managing editor of Chilton Books in Philadelphia. During a four-hour session, the films and stills were shown, examined under high magnification, challenged, questioned, argued about, and studied. The scientists did not agree on all points. They did not even all see exactly the same details in the often hard-to-read blow-ups. But after careful scrutiny over a period of hours, not one voiced the suspicion that there was a vague possibility that someone with enormous funds, a strange, undecipherable motivation, a disregard for life and limb, and an enormous knowledge of anatomy, physiology, photography, and human psychology might have been clever enough to set up a hoax good enough to fool the top experts in their field. In addition, in a separate screening, the film was shown to Dr. Osmond Hill, head of the Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center at Emory University. Dr. Hill said, among other things, all I can say that is, if this was a masquerade, it was extremely well done and effective. He also expressed the feeling that this evidence was strong enough to induce some group to mount an expedition to search for further evidence. So what's the next step? At this point, everything clearly indicates the need for a major expedition with helicopters, two-way radios, and possibly dogs 
to set on the trail of the next Bigfoot scene, though I've heard that dogs usually run the other way when they get a whiff of the Bigfoot spoor. I can guarantee one thing for myself and Argosy Magazine. This story is definitely to be continued. Copyright Ivan T. Sanderson, Argosy Magazine, February 1968. Article courtesy of Tom Casino. Color photographs. Article courtesy Chris Murphy and Renee DeHinden, 1999. The Scientific View. Here are the views of three men acknowledged to be top experts in their respective fields concerning the remarkable creatures shown on these films. Dr. A. Joseph Wright, Chief Geographer, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. His view? The presence of large, hairy, human-like creatures in North and Central America, often referred to as Sasquatch, appears very logical when the physiographic history and the northern part of this continent is considered. The statement often made that monkey-like creatures were never developed in northern America may easily be discounted, for these creatures are more human-like than ape-like, and they apparently migrated here, rather than representing the product of indigenous evolution. The recent physiographic history of the polar edges of the North America reveals that the land migration of these creatures from Asia to America is a distinct and logical possibility. The compelling reason for this distinct possibility is that a land bridge between Asia and North America is known to have existed several times within the last million years, at various intervals during the Pleistocene or Ice Age. The land bridges, both on the north and south sides of the Bering Sea, were admirably suitable for migrations several times during the Ice Age. It appears, then, that these hairy, human-like creatures, sometimes called Sasquatch, could easily have migrated to North America at several times during the Ice Age. This is particularly plausible when it is considered that conditions were mild in that area when the land bridges existed. These creatures could have then found conditions along the way similar to their Asian mountain habitat and could naturally have migrated across the bridges. Dr. John R. Napier, Director of Primate Biology Program, Smithsonian Institution. His view? First, I observed nothing that on scientific grounds would point conclusively to a hoax. I am satisfied that the walk of the creature shown in the film was consistent with the biped striding gait of man, except in the action of the feet, which were not visible. I have two reservations that are both subjective. First, the slow cadence of the walk and the fluidity of the bodily movements, particularly the arms, struck me as exaggerated, almost self-conscious in comparison with modern man. Second, my impression was that the subject was male, in spite of the contrary evidence of heavy pendulous breasts. The body, the appearance of the high crest on top of the skull is unknown in man, but given a creature is heavily built as the subject, such a biomechanical adaptation to an exclusively fibrous raw vegetable diet is not impossible. The presence of this crest, which occurs only in male non-human primates, such as the gorilla and the orangutan, tends to strengthen my belief that this creature is a male. Finally, it might be supposed that the creature with a heavy head, heavy jaw and musculature, and a massive upper body would have a center of gravity placed at a higher level than in man. The position of center of gravity modifies the gait, and the easy stride shown in the film is not in harmony with a high center of gravity. Some of the questions I have raised might be solved by a scientific frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the gait and body proportions, and a study of the joint angulations of limb and displacements. Well, this should be done. The opinions I have expressed on this remarkable film are those of an expert witness, rather than a member of a jury. And Dr. Osman Hill, Director of Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center, Emory University. His view? The creature portrayed is a primate and clearly hominid rather than pongid. Its erect attitude in locomotion, the gait, stride, and manner of that locomotion, as well as the relative proportions of pelvic to pectoral limb, are all manifestly human 
together with the great development of the mammary glands. This does not, of course, preclude the possibility that it is indeed a Homo sapiens masquerading as a hairy giant. All I can say at this stage is that if this was a masquerade, it was extremely well done and effective. Without tangible evidence in the form of skeletal parts, a cast of the dentition, or similar physical material, I cannot pronounce beyond this group. However, the most interesting evidence they have so painstakingly produced should serve to stimulate the formation of a truly scientific expedition to the area, with the object of obtaining the required physical data. The Biography of Ivan T. Sanderson Husband to Alma, 1911-1973 Sanderson received degrees with honors in geology, zoology, and botany, and headed six expeditions in all parts of the world for such groups as the British Museum, Cambridge and London Universities, the Linnaean Societies of London, and at the Chicago Natural History Museum. He was the author of many books. One, Animal Treasures, was a book of the month selection in 1937. Others include the Hairy Primitives of Ancient Europe, 1967. Caribbean Treasure. Animals Nobody Knows. Living Treasure. Animal Tales. How to Know American Mammals. The Monkey Kingdom. And Living Mammals of the World. The Abominable Snowmen. Legend Come to Life. Written in 1961 and countless articles for various publications and Argosy Magazine, where he was science editor. Argosy, exclusive, first photos, California's abominable snowman. This is the end of this reading. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. This story comes to us from Argosy Magazine, December 1977. It's titled, Bigfoot, Man, Beast, or Myth? And is written by Jeff Williams. The number of reports from respected people the finding of footprints in areas too remote for pranksters to expect success lends credibility to the belief that something is out there. But what? There was a downdraft of cool mountain air following Virgil Larson as he moved down the forested slopes of Mount Shasta. Even though weighted by a chainsaw and tools, Larson moved through the northern California woods with practiced ease. He was a timber faller and had worked in the woods for 30 of his 47 years. His partner, Pat Conway, was off to the left, and Larson could no longer see or hear him. At the base of a towering Douglas fir, Larson sat down for a quick smoke. It was 8.30, Friday, September 3rd. As he smoked and enjoyed the cathedral solitude of the forest, he heard the sound of someone moving toward him from above, the sound of feet breaking the carpet of twigs and underbrush. Idly, Larson looked up and saw a figure moving easily toward him through the light-patterned woods. Hmm, must be the Forest Service guy coming down to check what we're cutting, he mused to himself. He glanced back at the figure which had closed to thirty feet but was moving away at a tangent. Thinking the ranger had missed him, Larson yelled. At that, the figure turned his head toward Larson as if seeing him for the first time, but kept moving away in long, swinging strides. Larson yelled again at the tall figure as it dropped down the ridge a little and disappeared behind a screen of trees. Larson began to get to his feet to see where it had gone. Abruptly, a few dozen feet below him, the tall creature rose from behind a bush and stared balefully at him for a a long second before disappearing. <laughs> at that moment, I realized I didn't know what the hell I was looking at, and that's when I took off. Larson 
A normally quiet and reserved man ran in terror down the other slope to his partner. Together, he and Conway returned to where Larson had been sitting. That was when they first became aware of the stomach-churning odor in the forest. It smelled rotten and rancid like an old bear hide, Larson recalled. To estimate the creature's size, Conway went behind the bush where it had been. Only by pushing his hat up on a stick could he be located behind the bush that the creature had easily looked over. It had to be about seven feet tall, but I don't know what it was, Larson said. I can only remember it looking over the bush, and I knew it wasn't a bear. Bears don't walk through the woods on two feet. I can only remember from the hairline up. Just dark hair pushed straight back. I can't remember the face at all. Larson studied the burning cigarette between his fingers and quietly admitted he lies awake now wondering what he saw. Was it Sasquatch? The giant ape-man that thousands believe stalks the vast mountainous forest regions between Northern California and British Columbia? Larson just shakes his head. The shock of seeing something so strange has blanked his mind on the subject. Larson's foreman, when questioned about the reliability of his faller, was blunt. Let me put it this way, said Ralph Gant. If Larson told me he had seen Jesus Christ, I would believe him. Sergeant Walt Bullington, the deputy sheriff who investigated the sighting, said, I think he's telling the truth, and as he knows it, he's not falsifying. Larson is just one of numerous reliable men who have spent years in the woods and have nothing to gain but the scorn of fellow workers who admit to seeing that giant hairy creature commonly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Unquestionably, there are mistaken sightings and outright hoaxes, but the number of reports by respected men finding of footprints in areas too remote for pranksters to expect success lends credibility to the belief that something is out there, and that something is generally reported to be about seven feet tall, covered with dark hair and virtually no neck. It has massive shoulders. Obviously, is heavy and leaves man-like footprints 14 to 18 inches long and 8 inches wide. The reports are not just a new fad. In April of 1840, the Reverend Elkanah Walker, missionary to the Spokane Indians, wrote a long letter to his superior filled with misgivings on the future of the Indians. They seem as fated to fade away before the whites as the game of their country. In closing, he added this surprising note. I suppose you will bear with me if I trouble you with a little of their superstition. They believe in the existence of a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. They say their track is about a foot and a half long. They will carry two or three beams on their back at once. They frequently come in the night and steal their salmon from the nets and eat them raw. If the people are awake, they always know when they are coming very near. By their strong smell, which is most intolerable, it is not uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles and then the stones will begin to hit their homes. Since that early report, the stories of Sasquatch have become legend. One of the most controversial pieces of evidence surrounding the creature centers on a short length of 16-millimeter film shot in 1967 by a rancher named Roger Patterson. Patterson, now dead, said he and his partner, Bob Gimlin, were looking for Bigfoot along the rugged Bluff Creek in Northern California when their horses suddenly spooked. Patterson was thrown, but struggled to his feet, with camera in hand, to make a jerky film of what appears to be a female Sasquatch moving away rapidly at an oblique angle. The creature turns and looks toward the camera, and her ponderous, hairy breasts are visible. Precisely because she had no hair on her breast, the film was rejected by many scientists who note that even on gorillas there is virtually no hair. Also, it walked in an upright manner that was unacceptable to most scientists. It was a powerful, rolling gait of considerable speed, yet it did not run. 
However, even the specialists at Disney Studios could not prove the film a fake. A group of Soviet scientists who are searching for their own Bigfoot, which they call more accurately a relic hominoid, viewed the film and agreed that because of the size of the muscles rippling visibly beneath the hairy coat, it was not likely faked, wrote Dr. Dmitry D. Donskoy, chief of the chair of biomechanics at the USSR Central Institute of Physical Culture in Moscow. With all the diversity of the locomotion illustrated by the creature in the footage, its gait, as seen, is absolutely non-typical of man. Apart from the film, footprints with the distinctive hourglass outline are the only tangible evidence that such a creature, a giant creature, may in fact exist. And those footprints trouble the highly scientific mind of Dr. John Napier, a visiting professor of primate biology at the University of London. In his book, Bigfoot, Napier studied hundreds of samples of the broad prints and said, there is a curious and persuasive consistency about the hourglass footprints. They present an aberrant but nevertheless uniform pattern. This is hard to reconcile with fakery. Napier, a specialist in the anatomy of ape and human feet, also studied casts from a set of prints in Bosburg, Washington, that stretched half a mile. Napier was surprised to find that the right foot was a club foot, possibly the result of a crushing injury in childhood. It is very difficult to conceive of a hoaxer so subtle, so knowledgeable, and so sick, who would deliberately fake a footprint of this nature. I suppose it is possible, but it is so unlikely that I am prepared to discount it. Napier concludes by saying, I am convinced that the Sasquatch exists but whether it is all that it is cracked up to be is another matter altogether. There must be something in Northwest America that needs explaining, and that something leaves man-like footprints. The evidence I have adducted in favor of the reality of Sasquatch is not hard evidence. Few physicists, biologists, or chemists would accept it, but nevertheless it is evidence and cannot be ignored. This conclusion, even from such an eminent scientist sticks in the throat of Dr. William Montagna, director of the prestigious Oregon Regional Primate Research Center, in a scathing denunciation of the Sasquatch legend and its investigators, Montagna wrote in the September Primate News, Fascinated by the unknown and goaded by his imagination, man is forever fabricating devils and saints. Nothing is to be gained by arguing with believers. Incapable of sifting reality from fantasy, they swear to have seen the footprints of Bigfoot or of the abominable snowman, Yete, and to have heard their chilling roars. Even the tricksters who would perpetrate these outlandish hoaxes sometimes come to believe in their reality of their creatures. Montaigne appears unwilling to at least keep an open mind on Sasquatch, but other eminent scientists are pursuing their investigations. Edward W. Cronin, Jr., a zoologist who spent two years in the Himalayas looking for the Yeti, concluded it had to exist after awakening one morning to find a clear set of prints in light and unmarred snow outside his tent. The Yeti, which may be a smaller, distant relation to the Sasquatch, passed by Cronin's tent and proceeded down a steep and dangerous slope that made it evident to the zoologist that the creature was far stronger than he was. He concluded in an article for the November 1975 issue of The Atlantic that, based on this experience, I believe there is a creature alive today in the Himalayas which is creating a valid zoological mystery. As evidence mounts that both a Yeti and a Sasquatch exist, the question of what exactly it is becomes more pertinent. The leading contender in the minds of a few scientists is Gigantopithecus, a massive creature that existed as late as 500,000 years ago in the Himalayas and China. His few fossil remains indicate he was more than seven feet tall. Dr. Paul Simons, the senior physical anthropologist at the University of Oregon, 
told me in an interview that it is conceivable that Gigantopithecus crossed the land bridge at the Bering Strait, just as man did some 50,000 years ago. My basic feeling is there is no such thing, but I'm not willing to rule it out, Simon said. He then added a fascinating bit of evidence that Gigantopithecus might have migrated while other primates, like the gorilla, remained in the tropics. He noted that chimpanzees and gorillas wear their teeth down similarly, and that Gigantopithecus and early man wore their teeth down in the same fashion. So it looks as though there is a similar jaw action, Simons said. Does that mean they went looking for similar food? At least it means their dietary adaptation was not similar to the chimp and the gorilla who stayed in the tropics, but it's hard to go beyond that. He said if there is something roaming the great northwest forest, why hasn't someone found conclusive proof? Skeletal remains, hair, or fossils? Such questions make thousands of skeptics react like Dan Mott, a rancher who has spent most of his 42 years hunting and fishing in the mountains of California. Yeah, Bigfoot is just a bunch of crap. With all those hunters out there every year, someone would have found one or shot one by now if it was really there. One man who ardently believes both that Sasquatch is in fact out there, but should never be shot, is Peter Byrne, a Britisher, actually, he's Irish, in his early fifties. Byrne has all the rugged looks of a professional game hunter, which is precisely what he was for twenty years in Nepal. Then, beginning in 1962, he made two expeditions in search of the Yeti. Although both failed, Byrne became convinced the Yeti existed. Then, at the urging of Texas oil millionaire Tom Slick, Byrne came to the Northwest to use his hunting skills in finding Sasquatch. For six years, Byrne has continued his lonely search, what he terms the ultimate hunt, but now, instead of a rifle, he carries a camera. From the modest trailer he calls home in the Dalles, Oregon, Byrne points at the dark coniferous forest that begins not far away. Once you go fifty feet into those forests, you simply disappear. It is as dense as any jungle, and we're dealing with a nomadic group, or individuals who stay in an area only one day before moving on. This adds to the difficulty of finding them. Byrne notes that the soil of the Northwest is too acidic for fossils, and that if a Sasquatch did die in the forest, other animals would eat it and scatter the bones within days. With only a handful of the creatures around and thousands of square miles of extremely rugged mountains, it is conceivable for Sasquatch to remain largely invisible. One only has to recall Ishii, the last of a stone-aged Indian tribe who remained hidden with his family in a canyon only eight miles from Oroville, California, in the early 1900s until he voluntarily appeared. The Tassaday tribe, another Stone Age people, were found in the Philippine jungles only in 1971. The mountain gorilla was not proven until 1902. Byrne, who has never seen or heard a Sasquatch, has seen 16 separate sets of prints that he, a veteran tracker, believes to be the real thing. If he feels sure that the Sasquatch are out there, why continue to hunt them down? It doesn't seem important except for one reason. We're not going to get protective legislation for something that is not proven. When it is known to exist, there will be expeditions, and some scientific expeditions can be awfully ruthless. We hope there will be full protection to the point where even a scientific expedition from the Smithsonian Institution will not be allowed to collect a specimen. Another veteran Sasquatch hunter is George Haas, a scholarly 70-year-old man who lives in an Oakland, California apartment filled with books and files on Sasquatch. Haas has the most extensive files on Sasquatch in the country, 3,000 news clippings alone. Like Byrne, he is strongly opposed to any talk of killing a Bigfoot just to prove it exists. The last thing we need to do is shoot or even capture a specimen. It is more than a rare animal. It 
may be a primitive man. To kill him would be murder. Indeed, why find him at all? To protect him, some argue. But if Sasquatch is proven to exist, there will be massive hunts by amateurs and professionals alike. It seems all too conceivable that the pressure of organized drives for Sasquatch, complete with helicopters and listening devices as used in Vietnam, would force the creature totally out of the area or into extinction. Find Sasquatch? Mm, to what end? So he could spend his life behind bars in a zoo? or be constantly probed and prodded by scientists, made cranky because they will have to rewrite their concepts of evolution? If Sasquatch exists, and the weight of evidence that he does is too much to ignore, then it seems best to let him and our dreams continue happily apart. We may find that we enjoy the legend of Sasquatch much more than the smelly beast itself. Copyright Argosy Magazine, December, January 1977. This is the end of the story. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.